Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Alexey, and today I have a special guest, Christian Donaldson. Christian is a metal sound engineer and music producer. Also, he's a guitar player of death metal band Cryptopsin. Christian has wonderful videos on courses on mixing metal in Nail the Mix, the best online community on recording, mixing, and mastering metal. It's a huge honor to have you on my YouTube channel today, Christian. And let's start our interview. How you became a sound engineer? I believe it's probably the same way as a lot of sound engineers started. Uh, I, I was having a band and I was recording. I, I was recording my first demo, and uh, I was just a bit of a control freak because uh, I wanted to touch everything because uh, I thought n not nobody was good enough or was not understanding enough like the level of uh, precision that I wanted to have. So every time that I went to the studio with like any engineer i was always like tell them what to do basically so in the end i just decided to you know what i'm going to try to do it myself and this is how it started you know so my next question is how you got into mixing metal oh but i've been listening to uh exclusively metal since i'm a teenager so it was pretty obvious i try to do some other stuff though uh you know when you start and you try to get gigs from uh any style so i, I try to do some uh uh, some rap, and I try to do some uh, a bit more rock or pop stuff, but it did not end up well. Every time I was trying to do something else, it was always uh, a disaster. But every time I was doing metal, it was always good. So, how you started working with metal labels? <clears throat> that's uh, that's a it's a funny question because uh, the first time I uh, I worked with the label, I started touring with Cryptopsy. Uh, uh, let's say in two thousand and four, I believe. And uh, and and like the the opening band that we were sharing our bus with uh, was an A and R for Century Media, and uh, it just appeared at the time that I was uh, finishing a mix from a band that uh, a local band from Montreal, and I just give like the CD, yeah, it was CD back in the days. So I give the CD to that A and R, and he really liked that band. So they signed they signed that band, which was called the Atmist, and and uh. And because of that, it was my first label. Jobs. And after that, I just worked with Cryptopsy, my own band, and it just went up more and more and more and more. And it just, you know, like the snowball effect it just became like a lot of uh, a lot of label work. And, you know, it's just amazing. Just, you know, how it is, like perseverance and uh, this is how, how, how things work. What should you be listening to create a good low end in a metal track? I, low end is always like vertical. Uh, I, I always try to A, B. First, it's very important to have your room set up because whatever you do, uh, if you just can't hear the low end, you're just going to guess. So guessing is the worst thing to do. You know, If you really understand your room and it's, it's well treated and your sub is really well balanced and uh, it's just at the right position and every, then there's no phase issue in your room. First of all, it's it's probably half the battle because you, you can understand what's going on. But, uh, yeah, that's the thing you have to do. You have to make sure you don't have any dips in your room because uh, you will just try to compensate and just, like, compensate for what you hear, and it's going to create some more problems. So to, to have, like, an environment uh, critically, that's very critical to have a really good environment that is, like, tuned for low end, and that's the hardest thing to do. It's, it's kind of easy to pad... Uh, to pad your room for top ends and stuff like that. But for low end, it takes a lot of work man, to make sure that you need some bass traps or tube traps and uh, some good subs and to know exactly where you put your subs. And so that's the first thing you have to know. And and then after that, you can just like try to refer to different, um, different, you know, sound that you really like. Or you sometimes you think I, I love to listen to rap just because the low end is so exaggerated. And sometimes you can try to bring that to metal, and that's that's it can create some very interesting interesting work. How do you create unique guitar and bass tones? You need to try out stuff. <laughs> that's the best thing to do. The easy way to to not make a unique sound is to use plugins that that are everybody's using. If you want to make sure, if you want to create something unique, try 
unique <laughs> unique amps unique uh, microphones and a uh, unique uh, you know some different combinations and stuff you never tried before you can blend different amps and uh stuff like that i'm not a big like amp blender myself uh but I do have my favorite cabinets and, and, and I know where and my favorite microphones and I, you know, I know what I like, but uh, if you really want to create some unique stuff, don't be, sh don't be shy to experiment. What do you usually listen for when mixing with a reference track? That's another, um, it's a bit of a tricky question because uh, I remember when I first started, I was listening to some, um, some reference track and I, I kind of, I was aiming for that sound, like almost copying the reference track. And that is a, it's kind of, it's kind of a double headed sword because it could be very, it can help you to learn, but it can really take away a lot of the, the sound you can achieve into your own song, you know, or into your own song you're mixing. So I try to listen to the overall balance and uh, maybe like if, if, if it's too exaggerated versus some like the other track, but uh, I think we should before before trying to AB with any other material, just try to make sure that like, you 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 get your song like the, where you want it because it can really like it can what's what's that term in English? Um, denaturate maybe I don't know if it's the right term, but denaturate the y your own sound that you're trying to achieve by trying copying something else so really just try to check the overall balance and just to see if you're into the ballpark if it sounds like um if it sounds like um uh close enough to be commercialized or something like that you know but don't try to copy the other mix too much because you as i said you'll lose like what's very interesting about yours. How often do you use MIDI key spikes for drums? I would say 100% of the time. <laughs> That's pretty often, you know. Every time I... Uh, key spikes are, are very part of... Uh, a big part of my workflow. I use key spikes uh, for everything almost, you know, for uh, <clears throat> gating cymbals, spot mics, uh, you can use it also to uh, sidechain a compressor to make sure it always compresses certain amounts, regardless of the hit, you know. So you can really use it for everything. I I couldn't mix without it, unless you have MIDI drums, obviously. But uh, for real drums, uh, I think it's uh, almost mandatory now. What is the difference on using key spikes and gate plugins for drums? I think the key spikes, first of all, it, is way more accurate because uh, you kind of have to go one by one to make sure they are phase aligned, you know, as a, opposed to the slate trigger where you just like, there's a bit of a guesswork. You know, so you, if you just phase align all your hit one by one, you, you, you're you certain that they are they will be uh, perfectly, like the gate will open all at, all at the right time. And second, what I do is like uh, the, those key spikes are created via MIDI, so you can use the MIDI to trigger anything else if you if you need to. So you can trigger an extra snare layer, and this will always be phase accurate with the the hit that you gave. Sometimes like slate, that's just something that I've noticed. Uh, sometimes it's just a bit before and a bit after, so you're gonna have some hits that are gonna be out of phase, and uh, you don't know why. But some snare sounds better than others, but that's that's the reason why because you're using you know a plugin on the track. But the, with the key spikes, it's a uh, it's it's a uh, foolproof. There's no mistakes. Do you mix hybrid or with plugins only? I I, I mix uh, hybrid and more and more with. I just get new gear all the time, so it's getting more and more uh, like with analog and less and less like plugins. I just find it so. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's better or it's it's worse. I don't think um, I don't want to start that debate because I think both can be equally as good. It's just that um, I have my, uh, my my game stages that I that I've worked throughout the years with my gear, so I know if it hits a certain spot. I know it's good, so it's just way faster for me. But it's just a matter of faster, and also, I think it's. it's I like I like the gear. For example, when I just, I know I'm tr I'm I'm gonna try a plugin for uh, let's say six months or a year, and if I really like it, I just buy the gear. 
if you are mixing with plugins only, how to make your mix stand out for big metal labels and bands? I, I don't know. It's been a while since I haven't mixed with plugins only. I've I've done it with Nail the Mix. That was uh, like my first time that I've mixed with plugins only for a while. I was pleasantly surprised, but I believe uh, what I would do if I would have to mix with plugins only, if it would be like a requirement, I would probably send the mix to a mastering engineer so to to make sure that you have an extra, you know, extra oomph for extra um, analog stage or, or warmth, if we can say it that way. Uh, that's probably what I would do do if i would have to mix with plugins only but right now like like the way my setup is made like i have my mixing chain that is like hardwire and i also have my mastering chain that is hardwire so everything just constantly connected so so you just do i just do everything at once so it's easier that way thank you so much christian for such a wonderful interview it was a huge pleasure talking to you it's always fun talking to you too <laughs> thank you very much